Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. So uh, I'm going to be talking about something I term movement oncology, looking at exercise and physical activity uh, as an intervention for not only prevention, but also treatment of cancer. And uh, before we begin, I've got a disclaimer here, because I know how litigious you are here in the US. Uh, um, but just kind of flipping this sort of message on its head, uh, physical inactivity can be detrimental to health. So before beginning any program of, of sedentary lifestyles, you should always consult with your doctor. And especially if you've been previously active, have a healthy body composition, or suffer from any sort of condition that would be worsened by a sedentary lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a health coach. I'm a certified personal trainer and also a nutritional therapist. Um, I turned my life around. I was my first client. I turned my life around from being somebody who was pre-diabetic, hypertensive, all sorts of issues um, in a very short space of time. And I changed career from an investment banker working with technology into what I do today. This is one of my clients. He'd been struggling for about five or six years to improve their body composition, to improve their health. Um, and this was a 12-week transformation. Um, here's a client of mine where we had to work for about a year to really make some, some progress. Um, but it was a remarkable transformation. I'm also a published author. My first book was Paleo Fitness, which is talking about how we should be moving as nature intended, uh, moving as our ancestors did. Uh, Paleo from A to Z was looking at other aspects of the lifestyle, not just diet and movement, but other aspects for health and well-being, an introduction to Paleo Fitness. Um, and as I got more into Play theory, and I very, focus very much on the importance of play. So this is a free book available on my website, primalplay.com, that you're more than welcome to download. Um, if you actually want to do more than just reading, when you visit my website, I have a free workout program, uh, Animal Moves Sampler, which is also available and accessible on my website. So some of you know that I'm quite fussy when it comes to food. And uh, I'm kind of old school paleo, I don't do dairy, and I definitely don't do cheese. And when people ask me why I don't do cheese, I have some fantastic research to validate as to why. And that reason is, the more cheese you consume, especially in the US, you increase your likelihood of being strangled by your bed sheets. <laughs> okay? So, of course, what comes to mind is, well, Daryl, obviously your data is bogus. Where, what, what are your sources? So my sources are the USDA and the CDC. Um, and you can validate this data. This data is actually kosher. It is over a 10-year period. And that's the relationship between cheese consumption and premature death by bedsheets. Um, we know that correlation, correlation isn't causation. Um, but it's amazing what you can do with data. So here we have one of the reasons why I no longer watch Nicolas Cage movies is um, you're more likely to drown. So there's a relationship between Nicolas Cage appearances in movies and swimming pool deaths over a 10 year period. You can track this yourselves, go to the CDC, uh, utilize IMDB, <laughs> and that's the relationship between the two. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think it's really important when discussing data um, to be really transparent and honest about our sources because we're so concerned with discussing whatever our narrative is, you know, confirmation bias can, can kick in very, very easily. So uh, I think it's really important to make sure we're very focused on representing data as it should be. So Hippocrates. Um, everyone is aware of this quote, I would, I would say, in this room, right? Let food be your medicine, let medicine be your food attributed to Hippocrates. It's on probably every blog you've ever read <laughs> uh, in terms of nutritional blogs. But that actually isn't Hippocrates. That statement didn't come from him, according to this research. Okay? Um, no idea why it was attributed to him, 
but nothing in his works uh, did he mention this statement. What he has mentioned um, is that walking is the best medicine. He mentions that we should have the right balance between nutrition and exercise. And if we find the right balance, we'll find the safest way to health. He also mentions that what isn't used wastes away. And if we have a deficiency in exercise, the body will become liable to disease, will age more rapidly, and become defective. Look well to the spine for the cause of disease, which is quite interesting, not the gut. Eating alone will not keep a man well. He must also take exercise, for food and exercise work together to produce good health. If you're in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you're still in a bad mood, <laughs> go for another walk. <laughs> so um, there's a, there are lots of mentions uh, by Hi Hippocrates about physical activity, about the synergy of good food and uh, a good movement practice for bettering your health. Let's get on to cancer. So pretty much all of us in this room knows what cancer is. Um, abnormal cells growing in an uncontrolled manner. Normally any mutation to DNA damage is dealt with by the immune system and it leads to natural cell death. If that doesn't occur, you have more cell divisions, further mutations, and that can lead to uncontrolled cell growth and cancer. Intrinsic factors are, we believe, genetic inheritance, along with the aging process, along with an increase in biological errors that occur at random and can accumulate, and increasing the likelihood of cancer. And extrinsic factors are lifestyle factors, are exposure to known risks, carcinogens, and the like. Um, but also hazards we may not be aware of. So how many people will develop cancer in their lifetime? One in two, one in three. Um, many of us are affected. Many of us know someone. Uh, may have ourselves suffered from cancer. So one in two will be diagnosed at some point in their lifetime. But more of us will beat cancer than ever before. And survival has doubled since the 19. 70s. We're living longer with cancer. So early 70s, in comparison to a few years ago, survival rates have increased significantly from the early 70s, pretty much across the board for all different types of, of cancer. Um, but early detection is really important. Uh, if, we, if we catch cancer at the earliest stages, you obviously increase your likelihood of survival. Uh, for some cancers, once you get to stage four, it's uh, extremely unlikely uh, or less far less likely to survive cancer. Uh, this is my little sister, Natasha. Um, she passed away uh, March um, 2016. Um, 39 years old of lung cancer. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this uh, is because her experience, uh, one not only really touched me, especially in terms of what we can't control, no matter how much we know, no matter how much we love someone. Um, but yes, uh, so this talk is kind of dedicated uh, to my little sister, uh, Natasha. So, um, what the f so what the F means what the family, what the friends, all the information uh, that's provided to you when you're suffering with cancer, or, or people want to advise you, people have read blogs, listened to podcasts, or, uh, read fantastic books, they know experts. Uh, and so my sister had so much information available to her as to what she should be doing to manage her condition. And I've kind of highlighted probably the top three discussion points that we had, regardless of the of the specialist or the layperson. So one was cancer being a relatively modern disease. Cancer being purely uh, a disease of civili modern civilization, uh, a disease of lifestyle, and um, cancer just didn't really exist a few generations ago. It's something that we're only dealing with now. So of course I was like, okay, let me, let me find out. How old, how old is cancer? So one thing for certain is it certainly predates humans. 
Um, some suggest it could be as old as multicellular life on Earth. Uh, tumors have evolutionary roots. Um, here, there's some research on creatures that predate mammals 255 million years ago, suffering with cancer, um, and right through up until the present day. So the earliest hominids, uh, Neanderthals, and also a few thousand years ago, cancer was part of the human existence. And of course, oncology comes from Oncos, which Gallen, who's one of the fathers of modern medicine, um, noticed that there was swelling and he used that swelling to describe tumours. So oncology comes from 2 AD and the description of what cancer does. Um, cancer and ageing. So I, I'm, I'm not sure who was speaking the other day about uh, average life expectancy in 1900. Uh, but many of us kind of forget that we didn't really live for very long at the turn of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, obviously because of infectious, infectious diseases, pretty much all over the world. Um, but even in 1948 in the US, average life expectancy was about 58 years old. Um, so it's really in the 21st or 20th century where we saw huge increases in average life expectancy. Prior to that, um, we didn't really live that long. In, on average. So is age a major risk factor for cancer? 75 of cases diagnosed in people age 60 or over. 10% only occur in adults between 25 and 59. So the predominant uh, age range are those for older adults. Less than 1% occur in children. And 77% of all cancers occur in those age 65 or over. And uh, here again, looking at average life expectancy, um, significant difference. So one life expectancy and also looking at causes of death by ranking. So in 1900, cancer was the eighth uh, cause, likely cause of death in 1900. The first three were diphtheria, tuberculosis, I think influenza were one, two and three. Heart disease was about five, the first kind of lifestyle disease within that ranking, and cancer was eighth. Uh, by the 40s and 50s, heart disease became number one, and cancer was about the third cause of, of death, and now heart disease is one, and cancer is two. So once we started to deal with communicable diseases, cancer and heart disease became one and two. Second discussion point was, um, we should always seek out natural forms of treatment. You know, chemo is toxic, radiotherapy should be avoided. Um, we can be, it can be dealt with purely through nutritional mechanisms. And my sister went through uh, a lot of torture making the decision. What should she do to tackle her cancer? And um, I had no idea that conventional therapies could be remarkably effective with certain types of cancer. So for testicular cancer, surgery and chemotherapy and or radiotherapy, there's a 96% survival um, over five years. It's about 91 over 10 years. Remarkably effective uh, utilizing chemotherapy um, in comparison to the 80s and 90s where people were really concerned about young men dying without any form of, without any cure but surgery and chemo, very, very effective for testicular cancer, even at stage three. For breast cancer, especially postmenopausal, uh, estrogen receptor positive cancer, there's a 91% chance of survival over 10 years. This is according to the NHS in the UK. Um, but the impact of chemotherapy in risk reduction is only 4%. Hormonal therapy, so letrozole, um, again for postmenopausal, only 7%. So the greatest impact in terms of survival is surgery and marginally with, with radiotherapy will give you 80% chance. Lung cancer, 29% survival rate uh, with surgery, an additional 5% with 
for chemotherapy. So when my sister was offered chemo, uh, the consultant oncologist, uh, the surgeon basically said, um, we wouldn't advise you to undergo chemo because there's only a 5% benefit, but it's, up to, it's obviously up to you. So 34% chance of survival, gold standard treatment on the NHS. The third issue or discussion point was around sugar, was around carbohydrates and its impact on cancer. Um, but is sugar really the problem? And I'll discuss that later. So let's get back to physical activity. What can physical activity do in terms of cancer prevention and also treatment? So there's strong support for reduced risk for many types of cancer. Everything from colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate, pancreas, lung, uh, lots of evidence, lots of supportive evidence in terms of risk reduction. But also, there's emerging evidence around treatment, using exercise as supplementary treatment. So if you are undergoing chemotherapy, if you are undergoing radiotherapy, utilizing exercise to actually uh, make the treatment easier to manage, um, but also reducing disease progression, reducing mortality risk, reducing the likelihood of reoccurrence, and also improving the chance of that intervention becoming effective. So there's huge uh, cohort studies uh, looking at exercise as an intervention, lots of studies supporting that. What's interesting about this is the amount of exercise that has the benefit, 240 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity. So a lot more than we probably would advise our patients to undertake um, if, they're taking, if they're having chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So what are the underlying mechanisms? How can physical activity assist, help us? So there's one, there's the decreased likelihood of developing insulin resistance. Uh, there's reduced systemic inflammation. There's a reduction in fatigue. There's improved mitochondrial function. Uh, it definitely improves immune system function. There's improved tumor suppression. Uh, DNA re repair, repair, P53, especially when it comes to BRCA1 and 2 expression. There's enhancement of antioxidant enzyme production. And also when it comes to epigenetics, there's an increase in telomere length. Uh, there's an increase in tumor suppression expression. So that's where most of the evidence supports the benefits of physical activity at the lowest levels. What about inflammation? So we all know inflammation plays a part in chronic lifestyle disease, such as cancer and other diseases. But oftentimes we hear about exercise increasing inflammation, chronic inflammation. Uh, we forget that the acute response tends to be highly inflammatory. So we feel this physically usually with DOMS, so delayed onset of muscle soreness, feeling sore 24 to 48 hours after physical activity, that's where we can feel physically that there's some inflammation. Um, what we don't feel necessarily is things like tuna, necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 1 beta, CRP. These markers will also be elevated post-exercise. But that inflammation, once we increase and maintain physical activity, reduces uh, chronic inflammation. So those, that acute inflammation actually dampens down chronic inflammation based on IL-6 and other cytokines uh, promoting healing throughout the body. And in terms of the best type of exercise, resistance training and aerobic activity is a far better combination than aerobic activity alone. And the resistance training is probably far more beneficial if you had to choose one over the other. So most of the studies I've seen about combining physical activity with conventional therapy tends to focus mainly on resistance training rather than any other intervention. So the long-term effect is you have down regulation, CRP, COX-2, TNF-alpha, IGF-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, prostaglandin uh, reduction, enough regulation of interleukin-6, which is anti-inflammatory, and interleukin-10. Blood glucose control. So we know that exercise improves insulin sensitivity and um, it usually happens within 24 to 48 hours after physical activity. Resistance training 
and aerobic activity tends to be uh, the most potent combination of exercise. Resistance training alone is far more beneficial than aerobic activity. And uh, we, we know that incident resistance risk decreases uh, and type 2 diabetes risk decreases if you're um, physically active. And if you're sedentary, you're twice as likely to succumb to metabolic syndrome. And the reason being is because 70 to 90% of glucose uptake is forced into skeletal muscle tissue. So if you're sedentary and there is no demand, there's no muscular contraction, that glucose has to go somewhere. Only 5% of that will be utilized for adipose tissue. And we also know that we don't require insulin to mediate um, glucose uptake. So GLUT4 does not require insulin to utilize for, uh, to mediate glucose uptake as long as you're physically active. <laughs> so if you're sedentary, you have to utilize insulin. If you're active, uh, insulin uh, isn't required. I had kind of proof of the pudding myself uh, when I started doing kind of t ketone testing. And I remember one morning being challenged uh, to be uh, tested for ketosis. And I said, there's no chance I'm going to be in ketosis because I ate a lot of carbs. So um, I just don't think it's going to happen. And uh, this morning I, I uh, got tested and I was told, oh, you're in ketosis. And um, I was like, quite surprised at that fact. And until I read about uh, the physiological, uh, physiological ketosis rather than just nutritional ketosis, and I recognized the fact that I'm really utilizing my glycogen because of the amount of activity that I'm doing. Um, I sometimes fast in the morning, which also contributes to this. So just living uh, the lifestyle that I do and eating a considerable amount of carbs, I can still have significant periods of time where I am in ketosis, which was quite interesting for me uh, and informative for me. What about moderating stress? So exercise regulates the release of cortisol, or can regulate the release of cortisol, especially within moderate to vigorous intensity activities. Um, there's a short-term physical stress, the body learns to adapt to a stressful situation, and the more intense the physical activity, the increase in cortisol secretion. The problem is, that should be for short, brief periods. Uh, if that becomes chronic, if that becomes significant amounts of endurance, then you're likely to be in a chronic, uh, stressful state. So lengthy durations of cardio or high-intensity high interval training can lead to chronic levels of cortisol for significant periods of time. So it's finding the right prescription to ensure you receive the maximum benefit from exercise and physical activity. Improving mood. So exercise impacts all of the mood hormones from endorphins, serotonin, uh, oxytocin when you have physical contact in close proximity to other humans. Uh, endorphins, as we know, it's a natural painkiller. Endocannabinoids are released when we exercise, the run is high. And uh, I believe that probably ancestrally we were going for a hunt, um, quite arduous, painful, um, highly stressful. You would feel much better if endorphins were released at the end of the activity as a pain reliever and, and you'd be encouraged to do it again because of a dopamine release than if you were just in constant pain after the hunt. You'd probably decide, you know what, hunting's far too arduous, I'm going to give it a miss. So there's a reason why these hormones um, are activated based on physical activity. Promoting gut health. So again, this is surprising for me looking at the research of uh, an increase in gut flora, volume and diversity, the more physically active you were. Uh, and that was linked to peak VO2 max. And one of the best studies I saw was looking at a group of rugby players. So the, the initial study said, oh, the reason why those rugby players have better gut flora and diversity is because they have much better nutrition than the average layperson. So what they did was they set up a control group of rugby players, um, you know, uh, rugby players in comparison to other rugby players, controlled the nutrition, so the nutrition was identical, other lifestyle factors were pretty much identical, and the only difference between rugby players 
was based on their peak VO2 fitness, and that accounted for 20% variation in diversity and, uh, and volume. So, um, so there's something about physical activity which promotes a healthful environment in terms of gut flora. Irisin. So this is known as the exercise hormone, uh, discovered in 2012. Not many people are aware of this hormone, um, but it's released from muscle after exercise. So muscle is increasingly being identified as an endocrine organ. And uh, it was named after the Greek goddess Iris. And irisin, when irisin is elevated, there's a 20 to 80% or 60% reduction in fat tissue production. Um, it converts white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. And it's a whole body me uh, mechanism. So basically any irisin that's circulating um, affects all tissues around the body. And an increase in irisin levels increases energy expenditure and improves glucose homeostasis. And if you have lower level levels of irisin, you're more likely to be type 2 diabetic. So it's really fascinating hormone. Um, and in terms of the type of activity, the most benefit is actually seen in aerobic activity or very low intensity uh, kind of resistance training. That's where most of the benefit occurs in, uh, with, with irisin. Which ones again? Um, pardon? Which ones again? Uh, aerobic activity and very low intensity uh, resistance training. So, you know, carrying your shopping bags at a sedate pace would, would qualify. Uh, in terms of the link to cancer, uh, rat studies uh, suggest that irisin can actually kill cancer cells uh, selectively. So we'll avoid normal cells and there's a 20, 22 times throughput on attacking cancer cells uh, than normal tissue cell death. So pretty significant. So what are the recommendations? How much should we be doing? Um, does anyone know what we sh how much we should be doing? <laughs> <laughs> What's the recommendation for the amount of physical activity per week? Minimum. 150 minutes. 150 minutes? Anyone else? Uh, yeah, 150 minutes? Yeah, okay. Wrong. It's 150 minutes of aerobic activity. It's two day, plus two days a week of resistance training. That's the recommendation. Or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. Okay? But that's the minimum for adults 18 to 64. If you're older than 65, it's exactly the same. <laughs> but you should also include balance and coordination in your program. And that's a bare minimum. That's not some, you know, an ideal. Okay, for children, 5 to 17, it's 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. And a lot of kids, unfortunately, aren't getting anywhere, uh, anywhere near that. And there should be three days of bone muscle building activity, jumping, climbing, you know, monkey bars uh, for children. And for children under five, and more importantly, very young babies, babies should be moving if they're not sleeping, basically. <laughs> So, uh, which is also incredible. So that's what the recommendations are for very young babies. They should be constantly moving unless they're sleeping or being fed. What about our hunter-gatherer ancestors, the Hadza? They engage in 14 times as much moderate intensity physical activity as we do in the West. And we know that they live healthier lifestyles. We know that their health markers um, are far better than, than ours. And some of that is attributed to, obviously, physical activity. And uh, on average, they move 10 minutes. 10 minutes, 135 minutes per day, the Hadza. And their diet is fairly omnivorous, uh, from meat, includes tubers, honey, berries, fruit, and other plant foods. How many of us meet the recommendations? Self-reporting, it's about 35% of UK adults, 21% of American adults. It's only 5% if you wear an accelerometer. Um, and it's about 8% for children in the, in the US and uh, teenagers as well. So many of us just aren't meeting the recommendations, even if, even if we feel that we're relatively active. 
Part of the reasons being it's the environment that we're in. So here I was in uh, Iowa. I walked about an hour to the conference. Um, it was during the summer. School was out. Uh, I didn't see any kids out playing. No kids at all. I asked a few adults that I did see, and they said, I assume they were at summer camp perhaps, and the adults were like, no, 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 the kids are inside. They're playing on their phones or consoles or on the computers. Our kids just don't go out and play anymore. And this was a really safe neighborhood uh, in the middle of Iowa. But they said probably for the last 15 to 20 years, kids just haven't been outside to play, even though they were playing when they were kids. I also saw signs like this, which I haven't, I've only seen in the US. I've never seen these anywhere else. Um, watch out, there might be a man walking. Uh, so, yes, uh, I've never seen anything like this. So, um, I was with Bob, yes, I think earlier today, and we were talking about the time taken to cross the street. Um, I mean, it's a dangerous pursuit just crossing the road because cars are, are just want to move. Um, also, I hadn't seen something like this, a drive up ATM. So, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous that you have to drive up, you just have to lean out of your car, you don't even have to get out of your car and walk to get your cash, you can just lean over and get your cash. So our environment has become engineered to encourage a, a sedentary lifestyle. Um, training has become beat yourselves up. Muhammad Ali didn't like exercise. He trained that way because he wanted to become the best in the world, but he hated every minute of it. Uh, everything we see on Instagram is about working hard, playing hard, pain is weakness leaving the body, no pain, no gain. If it's not hurting, it's not working. My warm-up is your workout. Um, I suggest that we should be playing more and still receiving some of the gain. In terms of how much we should be doing, we know we shouldn't be sedentary. There's a sweet spot of about one and a half hours to two hours per day of moderate intensity activity. If you start doing too much, as Tommy uh, mentioned the other day, basically it's not a good place to be. Average life expectancy lowers for elite athletes, especially endurance athletes. You have musculoskeletal problems, upper respiratory tract problems, uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, I mean, you become orthorexic, addicted to exercise. So we definitely don't want to be here. Um, we want to find that sweet spot, minimal effective dose. Back to sugar. I was here two years ago. I think it was uh, January 2016. Thank goodness Dawn the Main was here. Thank goodness, because my sister went on a ketogenic diet to tackle um, her cancer, and there was no improvement. So of course we assumed that she wasn't, you're not strict enough, sis. Well, yes I am, 5% carbohydrates. You know, I'm doing everything you say, I'm, I'm following it to, to a T, I'm in ketosis, blah, 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 blah. And the cancer just seemed to continue to grow. And I would ask people, I know quite a few people who are oncologists, and I would ask the question, they say, doubt, yeah, keep, just keep going, there'll be a change. Are you sure she's fat burning? Yes, she is. Oh, well, you know, maybe not. Maybe she's not working hard enough. Um, I came to this conference, and Dawn mentioned this paper, and it was about the fact that tumors can be heterogeneous. They can utilize multiple fuel sources. They don't necessarily always utilize glucose for fuel. Um, and I was, one, I was, I was quite angry at that, uh, but I was also relieved at the fact that there was some truth and some transparency about the discussions around cancer. Um, and my sister felt much better in herself because she was like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I believe this is beneficial, but it isn't quite working for me. Um, and this research isn't new. This is two, three decades old, this type of research. And we know that even within the same tuna, tumor, it can be fueled by uh, lipids, by glucose, by protein, by acetate, even within the same tumor. So you starve that tumor of glucose, that tumor can adapt and decide, I need to get, I need to get my fuel from somewhere. That's what happens. Um, so we just need to be very, very careful about some of the recommendations that we offer, these blanket recommendations, which may be useful and may be helpful, but may be significantly detrimental. Here I have all the research that I could find on the impact of physical activity on a general population. 
um, the 50% decrease in all-cause mortality and also all of the diseases and conditions uh, where excess has an impact. If you'd like to get a copy of that, that's available on my website. Um, together with all of the research uh, that, I could, that I could muster. And if you'd like to keep in touch with me, uh, here are my details. Um, thank you very, very much. We have five minutes for questions. That was great. Thank you. Um, sorry if I missed it, but what, what's the uh, operational definition for moderate intensity exercise? Good question. So yeah, for moderate intensity exercise, um, it tends to be if you're struggling to, uh, to sing, um, then you're mod that's moderate intensity. So there's, a, there's a, uh, something called the, the Berg rated um, Perceived exertion, yeah, rate of perceived exertion, a scale of 1 to 20 or 4 to 20 or something like that. Um, but I use the walk and the sing test. So if you can't, if you can't talk, that's usually uh, vigorous intensity if you're performing an activity. If you can uh, talk without getting out of breath, then you know you're in moderate. So for myself, uh, this isn't moderate intensity, what I'm doing here. I would need to be doing this. <laughs> Sorry for getting out of the camera, but yeah. So I would, <laughs> I would need to be doing this in order to be moderate intensity. So for a lot of us who are, who, who are being told, oh, just go for a walk and you'll, that's enough. Yeah, if you're very deconditioned, if you've been a couch potato for 20 years, walking will, will be uh, moderate intensity. But if you're, if you're quite active, walking will really do very little in terms of meeting those uh, number of workout minutes. Any other questions? Okay, great. So, okay. What, what, um, <laughs> like particularly oh. about, you mentioned um, Dawn Lemayne, what particularly about her conversations were? Like, well, it, well, what was, I mean, the key really was the fact that um, uh, she represented some research where the ketogenic diet could be beneficial, um, but it was the fact that she said, it's not a panacea, it isn't a silver bullet, um, there were lots of tumors where there's no impact whatsoever, and there are tumors whereby um, it may be detrimental, and also whereby there may be multiple fuel sources. So my sister had exact, I mean, the non-small cell lung cancer, which is what my sister had, that paper referenced that. So we were, you know, I was just like, oh my goodness, Dawn, oh, you know, can I, can I have some more information? I want to understand this as best as possible. And, uh, um, and, you know, probably the solution, if there was a solution for my sister, would be to change, uh, you know, maybe the cycle, the, the, the dietary intervention for her. So, you know, so maybe go, you know, high fat for a while, then cycle to high protein for a while, and see which of those interventions, you know, maybe high carb for a while, and see which of those interventions would have, would have some effect. Um, so one of the things she specifically says is that the ketogenic type intervention works in breast, colon, prostate primarily in people who previously have metabolic syndrome. So it would not work in anybody who's, a, it wouldn't, it would be much less beneficial in other people and it's particularly detrimental in melanoma. And glioblastomas are a big one too. Very yeah. helpful. They can be yeah. helpful but, and, and I think yeah. about that one if you have to have had metabolic syndrome right. before. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that one specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to, I suppose, just to take up my probably last minute or so, um, I, I mean, I've been in the, uh, kind of in, this, in the ancestral world for quite some time, and I, I remember uh, uh, Chef Rachel, some of you may or may not know her, it's actually her birthday today, and, and um, when I first saw her speak, she, she had triple negative uh, breast cancer, um, she had significant reduction um, uh, in the shrinkage of the tumours, by just going keto, um, and I saw her speak about this, and, and I saw the scans, um, very powerful um, uh, speaker, um, and I witnessed all of her journey um, until the tumours returned, and she had metastasis to the brain, and she was like, I'm still doing keto because this, this is going to work for me, and unfortunately, you know, it, she died. So, I, 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 you know, so, you know, <laughs> I think we're we're still it's never a treatment. Like, isn't that no, I I totally agree. I totally agree. But unfortunately, there's there's a lot of narrative around the fact that it is a treatment. So of course we're all 
very objective in this room. We're all aware that there are multiple factors. Uh, you know, you can't just pin your, your, your tail to, to one donkey. Um, but unfortunately, for the general public, um, which I'm, I'm far more interested in, and for people who I care the most about, they don't, they don't understand the nuance. They just see the headline, and they just see sugar equals cancer, carbs equals cancer, and it's, and it's extremely harmful. So, uh, you know, I don't want right, to be... Well, I'll stop there, <laughs> yeah. uh, just because we're already behind time. So. All right. Thank you.